Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, we're all happily caffeinated now, so we can look at the very recent, actually, let me stand over there, um, LZ Dark Matter results, which came out about a month ago, maybe a little bit more. So the LZ collaboration is spread across the UK, US, Portugal, and Korea. Our detector is out in South Dakota at the Sanford Underground Laboratory. Um, you already heard um, the last few days from Kim, Daniel, um, and Christopher about how the xenon technology, the xenon double um, two-phase TPCs work. Um, so I'll be fairly brief on this. We have um, a big bucket of xenon, basically, and we are looking for dark matter interacting via nuclear recalls as our primary method here. We get two signals. So first of all, um, the nuclear recall will cause a scintillation signal, so that's light we can detect with our photomultiplier tubes on the bottom and the top of the detector. And then we have these electrons which drift upwards and we get the S2 signal. So in terms of waveform, it looks like this, so that's a real LZ waveform example. We have the scintillation signal, which you can see is much smaller compared to the S2 signal. So this is really what's going to set our threshold. Um, then we have this time difference in between, which is the time the electron takes to drift up. And then we have the larger electroluminescence signal, which, because it's so close to the top array, also um, gives us a nice hit pattern. So we have X, Y, C reconstruction, which is really nice for fiducialization. This is just the central part of the detector. So it sits inside of um, the cryostat. So we have an inner and an outer cryostat vessel. We, of course, need to get the cables out somehow. Um, and then we have our neutron veto detector. So we have these scintillator tanks and PMTs watching them. All of this is inside of a water tank and about one mile underground um, in the Black Hills out in South Dakota. Now, a quick picture around, um, just because it's so beautiful. Um, this is our TPC fully assembled, so you can see it's all white because we want good um, light collection efficiency, so we have higher reflectivity here. We have the PMT arrays on the top and the bottom here. You can see a view onto the bottom PMT array. That's R the R11410 PMTs from Hamamatsu. And then we have the grids, which you can't really see here, like they're on the inside, which we use to apply our electric field. So we have the drift field and the extraction field. And those were actually woven um, by collaborators at Slack. Now, um, one thing we have on LZ as well is we make use of this thin region, a few centimeters between the cryostat and the TPC as a gamma veto. So we do that by just having PMTs. These ones are downwards looking, and then we have them underneath the bottom array and on the side, and we tile the whole cryostat such that we can make use of these few extra centimeters of xenon we have. And then, of course, we have our outer detector. So these are these beautiful um, Scintillator tanks, they are made out of acrylic um, and they're filled with 17 tons of gadolinium loaded scintillator. So if a neutron, which is one of the most dangerous backgrounds for us because it would cause a nuclear recoil, um, if that comes in, it would capture on the gadolinium and you get a, um, a range of gammas which go up to a total energy of 8.5 MeV. Now, the pictures I showed you of when the TPC was fully assembled was back in August 2019. Since then, a lot has happened. We went underground. We had lots of commissioning activities happening underground. Our um, xenon was krypton reduced at slack. And then finally, in 2021, we filled with gas. We cooled down and finally also filled with liquid um, at the end of last year. We commissioned our detector, and now we have our first science result. So on this slide, I just want to take a moment to appreciate how well our detector is working. Um, we have more than 97% uh, of our PMTs operational, which is great for highlight collection efficiency. We have our drift field at 193 volts per centimeter and our extraction field at 703 kilovolts per centimeter. And those, those two quantities are really important for our discrimination signal to background um, to get our electrons out. Um, and so to have an optimally working detector, it's also very stable. So here, just an idea of the temperature and the gas pressure. We also need to continuous, continuously purify because from the plastics in them and other materials, you get outgassing. So we want to get rid of electronegatives in the detector and we can get 
through three to three tons per day, um, and we have a hot getter system, um, and then we get this beautiful electron lifetime. So down here was our requirement. We're throughout um, at five to eight um, milliseconds. You can see this was um, an overview of the SR1, so our science run one. We had 160 calendar days. There's some interruptions for calibration here, um, the circulation change. So this is some period we will cut out of the data. And that together with, um, with some additional data quality cuts, we get down to 60 live days. Now, the first thing having a working detector we need to do is understand the detector response. And so we calibrate it. Um, what's really important is we have these two bands, right? That's how we discriminate. Our signal will lie in this um, nuclear recoil band, and our, most of our backgrounds will lie in the electron recoil band. We calibrate both bands with here um, that's tritiated methane. That's a nice beta source. Um, you might have heard in the other talk about tritium being a difficult background, but that's why we have the methane, so we can actually get rid of the tritium after having done the calibration. For the NR band, we have deuterium, deuterium neutrons, so we have a generator sitting outside of the water tank, and we have this conduit where we can shoot the neutrons through. And then we use the noble element simulation technique to get our G1 and G2 values, which um, encode our detector response, so to say. If we were to do a cut and count below this 50% um, NR line, we have a 99.9% .9 discrimination, but we actually do a PLR, and that's why it's so important for us um, to understand our um, background so well. But first of all, the outer detector, I told you about our neutron veto, um, and so we also calibrated this. On the left-hand side here, you have our californium um, source, and you can nicely see the 8.5 MeV endpoint. And so it was a question of choosing a window because the, neutrons, um, the neutron response in the OD is delayed. So we have this window of 1,200 microseconds, which gives us an, an 88.5 a single scatter neutron tagging efficiency, which was determined using calibration sources. Now, for our backgrounds, we really need to understand these very well, and we had a really good idea coming in because we did a very dedicated screening campaign of all detector materials. Um, on the left plot here, those are the different regions where the different um, backgrounds will lie. So this is our ER band where most of them will be. This includes many different components, so the soft beta emitters, um, electron captures, gamma emitters from the materials, and also some no solar neutrinos. And then we have our NR, back, uh, NR band where really it would only be neutron emission from spontaneous fission. And down here, um, the blob where boron-8 um, would appear. We also have um, always a worry about having accidental um, backgrounds where we have a, sing a single S1 by itself, maybe from below the cathode, or like grid emission, so a single S2, and we could pair those together, which would be additional backgrounds, so we do need to understand those. Um, we simulate all of this, and this is how we get these PDFs. So using our calibrations, we can very precisely predict of where we expect these backgrounds to be. Using um, higher energy data, so not the WIMP search region, and in some cases the simulation, we have estimates of what our expected events are. And here two stand out, so the beta decays up here, which are large contributions, and the argon 37, and I'll briefly talk about the, both of those. So the betas, the main thing here is, the, is radon, and it's the 214 lead beta decay, um, which is the problem. Radon emanates from our materials, and we have some radon reduction in our gas phase where the uh, cables are, but um, otherwise we do need to live with the radon, and we do need to understand um, what the rates are. So we can do that by using the radon chain where we have many alphas and we can um, fit these peaks and then estimate where the lead 214, what the activity would be. We can also do a spectral fit of all internal backgrounds, which you can see here. Um, so our WIMSATS region would be somewhere down there in terms of energy and we can fit the rest up here and really estimate um, what our backgrounds are. So we have a good understanding. Argon 37 is an interesting one. It's because we, um, so Argon 37 occurs in the atmosphere, but also through activation by cosmic spallation. So when we transported our xenon from slack, where it was krypton reduced, to site, we 
temporarily activated like the argon-37 uh, or got argon-37 in our xenon, and that will slowly decay away because we have a 35-day half-life. And so we expect about 100 decays of argon-37 plus minus. Um, there's a whole paper we published earlier this year about where those numbers are coming from. Now, we have our background model um, onto the data. We do need to do some data selection. And here I should mention um, our first science run was an engineering run. We wanted to see, does the detector work? So we did not blind the data. But we did make sure that all cuts were developed on non-BIMP RRI background and calibration data to not bias ourselves. So that was our bias mitigation strategy. And um, so we have here, you can see the reconstructed radius squared and the drift time, so that's kind of how, how we picture where events are in our detector. And we do select only single scatters, we select only in the region of interest, and then we make this fiducial volume cut. And you can see how much that helps already because xenon is very good at self-shielding, so anything coming from the outside is likely to interact in this region. Um, then we have our vetoes. I told you about the skin and the OD. So all the red crosses here is the skin. The blue circles is the OD, um, and we can get rid of a lot. Even inside of the volume, you see here, we have some um, events which are vetoed by our OD. We have some S2, S1, S2 shape cuts because we kind of know what our signal looks like to get some, rid of some um, pathologies. And then we have time period cuts. So when the detector is especially noisy, we don't want to use that. And that brings down our lifetime to 60 days. So in terms of efficiencies, just very briefly, this is our trigger efficiency. Then we have this low energy efficiency here because we impose an S1 threshold. We want to see the signal in at least three PMTs and three PhD. Um, and then we have our data analysis cuts. And this is because we don't look at the very high energy stuff. So we, we, we are staying in this region here. So this is our final data set. Um, we have th 335 events um, surviving in 60 life days and 5.5 times fiducial volume. And this is our um, ER background spectrum. So those are the same PDFs I showed you earlier. You see most events lie up here. We have our argon 37 clearly here. And you see down here we're doing really well with leakage. Up here we have some leakage events and you do expect some leakage. So that's all perfectly fine. Um, and then we do our PLR fit. So these are the expected events I showed you earlier, which are informed by data analysis on higher energy data, on our knowledge about the detector. And this is the best fit, which comes out from the PLR. And in a visual form, you've got this plot here where very obviously you have your argon 37 and then your beta decays here. Our backgrounds are within what we expected. So we have about 25 carons per kVEE tan year. Um, and let's see the limit plot. Um, so this is our first WIMP search. We have achieved world-leading limits in the WIMP nuclear and spin independent um, region. So our minimum is down here at six times 10 to the four, minus 48 at 30 GeV. So the dotted line here is the median expected sensitivity. And if you compare our limit here, you will see we did under fluctuate in backgrounds down here, which is great for us right now. Like it's it looks like we get down quite well. You remember we have some events leaking up here, so we're um, a bit above the median expected sensitivity. Um, but yeah, lots more info in our paper. And we also have the spin-dependent searches, so here for the WIMP neutron scattering and then for the WIMP proton scattering. But here we have the caveat that there's, there's huge uncertainties, or like large uncertainties, in the xenon form factor. So this is the gray band here. So we're really happy what to take away from this. Our detector is working really well, um, as expected, and we can do great science with it. This was a short engineering run. Um, we can see we can, we can get world-leading limits from it. From our, comparing this to our 1,000-day exposure projected sensitivity from a few years ago, um, you can see where, where we might get to. And we have 17 times more exposure to come. And we have more physics searches to do, not just um, the, the WIMP search. So very exciting times. And we're also starting to think ahead um, towards the next and the ultimate liquid xenon observatory, as you have already heard um, about yesterday, and maybe the day before as well. So we formed XLZD. You've already heard from xenon yesterday, me today, and Darwin 
will be tomorrow um, with Adam's talk, um, so that kind of fits in well. So I'll leave you with my summary slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theresa, for this nice talk. So are there questions or comments? There is one here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's, an, it's, it's really impressive how you go with the background down. Um, but can you please go to slide 19? Maybe I misunderstood the numbers. There you have the table with the expected results and the best fit. Um, and to me, the numbers agree too well. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what, what's behind this? So I think the two which kind of changed a bit is the, the beta decays here and the, the argon. Um, the other ones are quite well constrained from um, the analysis we did and also literature for like the neutrinos. And then there's not very much data to constrain it much okay. more in the fit. It does, did, it's like some of them look funny. They did change in like more like, uh, not, not to the significant we're stating here, but the further down digits did change in the PLR fit. Okay, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. um, on your slide about the spin dependent cross section limits, you mentioned there's significant uncertainty in the spin dependent cross section. Is it yeah. more than just the energy? Re so I want to ask. What is the dependence on the wimp mass that you assume? Is it only the recoil energy that you're? folding into the theory uncertainty, or is there more dependence in the form factor? Uh, so I think, I think the difficulty here is that we have to, okay, I'm not an expert on this, but, <laughs> but I think the difficulty is so for the, we have this, for these searches, we use the um, odd neutron I isotopes um, for, for this, and for the WIMP proton search, we have to assume some sort of um, coupling of the of, sorry, of the form factor for odd to get to this. So I think here really we're, we're not even showing um, these bands because the, the uncertainty in the form factor is the, is the dominant thing. Okay. Sorry, there's more, I think there's more detail in the paper. Uh, yeah, one question on the background spectrum. Um, so could you explain what accidentals are and why yeah. that spectrum is just flat? Accidental coincidences. So we get isolated S1s and S2s from... So S1s are usually like Cherenkov in the PMT windows or if we have events below the cathode which don't have an S2. S2s are grid backgrounds, so emission of electrons from the grids. And so we actually constructed um, this accidental coincidence PDF by just taking isolated S1s and S2s um, and stitching them together into events. And we were able to um, look at unphysical drift time events, which are events where the drift time is longer than we know our detector is tall, so we can look at them um, easily. And so we, the reason why we have very few um, accidental events is because the analysis really focused on how to get rid of those, right? Like we really sat down and thought about, and like when you see like the S1 hit pattern and S2 hit patterns, you do get some information about how to, how to get rid of them. But this is the PDF which actually went into, into the PLR. Uh, do you make to your data a Fourier analysis whether they are really random over the whole period or how it looks like a, a, the a Fourier analysis of your raw data? I don't think we did a Fourier analysis, but we did look, um, because we have few events, right, so we did look at, at them in kind of a time, time series to see, especially for the, the, one, for the ones down here, to make sure um, they are not all occurring at the same time of day or um, like only during weekdays when we work. So we did look at like kind of the time series, not necessarily a Fourier analysis, but the time series. Mm 